This is a test of a very early bulletproof vest. Uh, I'm not kidding. I want you to think about this for a second. Now, I don't know if you know anything about old pistols. They are notoriously inaccurate or inaccurate. They didn't have a lot of power, which means that they could build a vest to repel it, but he could have just as easily taken that shot in the arm or the leg. Kind of makes you think about the type of faith he would have had to have in that vest, doesn't it? And the faith in the person <laughs> shooting at him while he's wearing the vest. But you will notice they're both wearing a vest. <laughs> that means they were both getting tested upon. Think about the different things we do to uh, improve our faith in certain things. Like this, this guy getting shot at would have had to have had a tremendous amount of faith, and the other guy was probably going to get shot at too. Um, even today in, uh, like for example, the Army, whenever you go through basic training, they, they teach you to uh, develop a kind of faith in your protective mask by making you put that sucker on and walk into a room, room full of tear gas. Then they make you take the mask off while you're in the room. It's a bit of a humbling experience because just something as simple as a little bit of smoke will make you into a little child who is crying and bawling for his mommy. Okay, maybe it was just me. But they do that to kind of build up our faith and our equipment. That's, that's, that's what it's for. They, they, the military, and, and in this situation, there's policemen standing in the background, so it's police. They're trying to teach a faith in something uh, by getting people beyond this, um, uh, I guess, this barrier of, um, I'm kind of afraid. You get all the what ifs out in front of it, don't you, in, in situations like this. You know, what if I'm, you know, working on a car and I know that if I put this part in wrong, it's going to make the motor come apart? Or, or what if I'm sewing something and while I'm wearing it, the stitches aren't right and they come loose out in public? There's a little bit of fear. No, I'm, I'm serious. Aren't, isn't, isn't that what happens? My grandmother was a, was a seamstress. Um, so we have all these things in life where, there has, where, where we have to get beyond this step of if. We have to get beyond all the big ifs out in front of us. And sometimes that's difficult. Something has to help us take the step of faith, the leap of faith. And, and for these people uh, in our passage today, something had happened. Uh, you read later in the passage about Lazarus. And a few chapters before this had been the moment where Jesus had spoken and called Lazarus from the grave. He had been dead for four days. And so that may be something, just this, this little thing, especially the people who had, you know, wrapped him in the burial clothes and, 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 and just lovingly laid him in his place of rest, suddenly seeing him there may have been that thing that got them beyond the big what if of is Jesus Lord. Do you think that would do it for you? If you saw it, 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 I don't know if I would be more scared than I was before, or if I would just, I, I, within myself, to be confessional, I don't know how I would have responded to that. It would have just been that magnificent and great of an event. I would like to say that I hope that, yes, the only response I could have had is to bow down at the feet of Christ and give him all the adoration that he deserves. But I'm going to be honest. All of us, I believe, have some amount of fear within us to make that step. And really, we have to think about... Um, what it says about Jesus in that moment. Because some confusion was occurring. When, when all of the religious folks of the time were reading uh, their scriptures, they had made an assumption because, I mean, think about it. Uh, they were under oppression and had been under a constant state of oppression or slavery for 400 years. And so they looked into the Bible and they saw 
uh, the scriptures where it talks about the coming of a Messiah who will free the people of God. And they kept holding on to that and holding on to that. And they made some assumptions because the Bible also says this will be someone who's from the line of David. And, and his reign will restore and rule throughout all of time and space. And that's some great and awesome things. But because they were people under oppression, they also automatically assumed that this would be a, a military conquest of some sort. That God would walk in and the chains of the oppressors would fall off and the enemy would be destroyed and, and laid in waste before the armies of God. That was what they had assumed. Can you see why they would have assumed that? I mean, if you're in a constant state of oppression, if, if something's just weighing on you, or, or, and we, you know, we all have our hang-ups in life. We have our, our little uh, sins, our little things we don't want to let go of, and we know we need to, but we can't quite let go of them, and we would just pray to God and ask God, say, God, just come in and... And, and walk into our lives like that conquering king. And suddenly with the wave of his scepter, it is all taken care of. Is that how we normally experience the life of faith? Sometimes it is. Even John Wesley wrote that there is no doubt that God could, just with a thought of, of, of his imagination, could set things right in our lives, but God is doing something sometimes within us. God is, is helping us to grow and to move on the other side of things. Have you ever experienced a child who has been given everything? Yes, we have, haven't we? I think God is trying to avoid that particular mindset sometimes because he knows we could fall into it. Sometimes we do develop a sense of entitlement. And so the, the passage that they, they missed in the Bible, uh, if you could hit the next slide, is this passage from Zechariah. Um, I don't think they missed it. I just think they hadn't included it when they were thinking about who the coming Messiah was. It says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout and triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Now, that's the verse that's being quoted by the people shouting, Hosanna. That's the verse that they're, that they're yelling out at first about, uh, or, or the second one where the king's riding on the donkey. But there's this other verse that comes after it that tells us something very important. And it is, I will remove the battle chariots from Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem. I will destroy all the weapons used in battle, and your king will bring, bring peace to the nations. His realm will stretch from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. So is the Messiah, the coming king, that they are to expect bringing, coming on a war horse? Is he riding in a chariot? Is he coming to bring the death and destruction on the enemies of Israel that they're expecting? Traditionally, if you look in the scriptures, if a king rides on a donkey, he's coming in peace. And this passage just highlights that. Why would Jesus come in peace? He's trying to be the king of light and peace. I think if we look at this, the name Prince of Peace, which is one of the names that is given to Christ, we can see and understand with our minds what he's trying to do. Um, anybody ever watch old Italian mobster movies where, you know, somebody gets, gets whacked doing something and then uh, the people around him, what are they going to do? They're going to go get revenge, right? It sets up this whole cycle, this back and forth. I don't know if you ever watched any Godfather movies. They managed to stretch this out for three movies. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, just this cycle of revenge. And so if Christ had come as a, a conquering king and destroyed the, you know, the Romans that were enslaving Israel, what would have been the, the, the mental response of anybody that was left? Right, to wipe them out. And sometimes this is hard for us to, to hold on to but God wanted to abolish this cycle of revenge and death. 
And so he knows that at the end of this week, if you can hit the next slide for me, he knows that at the end of this week he's going to be crucified. He's going to give up his life. He is going to sacrifice himself just so that nobody could lay claim to a need for revenge upon him. He is the prince of peace. Who cre he creates the situation where people can lay down any claim that they have for anger and vengeance. He is taking it upon himself. All the hurt, all the pain, all the agony, and even the death that we must take. How blessed is that? That God would come, take his glory off like a robe, so to speak. Many of you seem to have taken off your choir robes. Taking off the glory of heaven like a robe and laying it aside and becoming like you and I. A person who, as a carpenter, I'm sure he got splinters. A person who probably, when he was a baby, cried to be fed. A person who would know even the pain of seeing his friend Lazarus uh, in the tomb. But then also as God who has the power to say, Lazarus, come forth. How blessed is it that we have a God of such grace and power. For us, I think that, that there are two things we must consider uh, at the end of all of this. How do we do what God has called us to do? How do we be a people who, after proclaiming that Christ is Lord, do this thing he's called us to do, to, to reach out to others, to make disciples? And we see a clue in what's going on here. Uh, that in the, near the end of the passage, it talks about this, this group of people who had seen Christ raise Lazarus from the dead. And what were they doing? They were going out into this other crowd. This other crowd was gathered for the Passover in Jerusalem. There's a bunch of people there. And this crowd from Bethany, which is where uh, Lazarus' house was, had gone into Jerusalem and they were telling people all about how Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead and then people had come a-running. Can you see that happening? Something spectacular is happening. Uh, some, some guy uh, that can raise people from the dead is walking in the front gate of the city. Do we want to go see him? Yes, this is exciting. We don't have TV. <laughs> don't have video games. Don't have cable. Don't have all that stuff. Something exciting's happened. Let's go running. And in a way, it's kind of foreshadowing what Christ is calling us to do because when Christ died on the cross, it started this thing called the inrushing of the kingdom of God. Where God is saying, I am taking back this world that is fallen and corrupted, and we're going to do it with love. We're going to go out into this world and we're going to tell people about what Jesus has done for us. We're going to tell people about this king who has conquered death. This person who has spoken the very words of life. And for the next 2,000 years, it is who we have been supposed to be. Is the world perfect yet? No. No there's another coming, that it will happen. The second coming will be Christ riding in victory for the final judgment. It is the one that the Jews had been looking for then. But I'm not so sure if we want that now. Because in my heart, I don't feel like the world is anywhere close to ready. We haven't told enough people about who Christ is. It is that important. There is a God who loves so much that he let himself be killed, but then showed resurrection power. I'm asking you people, go out and tell folks about this Christ. He's already come once as the Prince of Peace. The next time he comes, he'll be riding that war horse. I just... 
I want to know this God of love as much as possible, and I hope you do too. And I also hope that you want to take this message of this triumphant king who comes to love all of us, all who would listen, so that one day we could experience a life that is beyond just mere flesh and blood, but a life that is full, powerful, immortal, eternal. Let's bow our heads.